you can go ahead. Very much. Uh, first of all, let me uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I uh, I'm a basic scientist with an interest in uh, translational research. So for me, it's very important to be able to uh, communicate to the larger public, and uh, I really uh, am grateful for the opportunity of uh, uh, giving this webinar today. And uh, please don't be shy on the on the question. So I am uh, this guy right here on the oh the pointer. Of course, now it's no longer working. Uh, give me one second. Let's see if we can. Yeah. So. I am this guy right here, uh, and uh, this is my uh, research group at the University of Ottawa in the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, uh, where we focus on uh, uh, cancer immunology and uh, uh, cancer immunotherapy. So we're trying to develop uh, uh, a better understanding of uh, uh, the immune system and how the immune system is able to fight cancer. Uh, with the idea that having a, a broader knowledge of these uh, mechanisms will lead also to uh, therapeutic possibilities exploiting uh, uh, that knowledge. So uh, this is an uh, outline of my of my seminar. I'm going to discuss with you very basic concepts of cancer and uh, the immune system and their uh, relationship. Uh, the, uh, then we're going to discuss the immunotherapy revolution, uh, which is basically this uh, new therapeutic approach that has been taken in the last maybe 10 to 20 years, uh, which is based on the idea that we can use the immune system to fight cancer. And finally, I have a couple of slides of uh, conclusion, and then I will be uh, taking any question that you have. Again, don't be shy, really. Uh, so let me start with cancer and the immune system. And uh, uh, of course, you probably know that cancer is a terrible disease, and uh, it is uh, uh, currently the first cause of death in Canada. And it's always uh, either the first or the second cause of death uh, uh, worldwide, uh, according to the, to the country. And uh, uh, therapeutic efforts to uh, to, uh, to treat cancer are, the, uh, are, are of course, uh, uh, one of the main uh, key aspects of research, not only in my lab, but in, uh, in many other uh, research labs worldwide. Uh, so first of all, let me ask, uh, uh, what is cancer? And maybe we will spend uh, a couple of minutes discussing, uh, discussing this. So to put in uh, uh, layman terms, uh, cancer is uh, uh, the process uh, by which uh, uh, normal cells, uh, which have a controlled uh, uh, cell proliferation, so they divide according to certain rhythms, uh, break those rules, uh, break those controls, uh, and start dividing uh, in an a, a uncontrolled fashion. Uh, this is a process that in uh, biology we call cellular transformation, and it's uh, very strictly associated with accumulation of mutations in key genes uh, that control the division of uh, uh, cells. You can see this in uh, this cartoon right here. Uh, there are many different kinds of cancer, and here in this ribbon is uh, one ribbon for uh, one uh, uh, kind of cancer, and broadly we uh, categorize these cancers uh, according to their uh, tissue of origin. For example, cancer that derive from epithelial tissues are called carcinomas, for example, lung, prostate, or breast. There are also uh, cancers that derive from uh, hematopoietic uh, tissues and uh, of, of hematopoietic origin, or from uh, mesodermal tissues, for example, uh, uh, sarcomas. Uh, there are different agents that promote uh, cellular transformation or the generation of cancer. These are all agents that have in common the fact that they lead to accumulations uh, of uh, uh, mutations into the genome of the uh, normal cell that is becoming a cancer cell. Uh, there are different kinds, there are physical agents, such as UV lights, uh, as well as uh, some chemical agents, uh, for example, cigarette smoke, uh, but also some uh, uh, agents linked to uh, microbes. For example, it's known that some viruses can uh, cause cancer. And altogether, uh, these uh, agents are able to lead to mutations in the uh, DNA of the uh, cells. And these mutations in the uh, genes uh, that regulate the, con the uh, division of the cells uh, is what eventually will lead to uh, the cellular transformation and the generation of the uh, cancer cells. One truth about cancer is that cancer is not one disease, but it is rather a collection of diseases. This is very well explained in this uh, diagram right here with the incidence of different kinds of cancer. And as you can see over the year, and as you can see, there are a number of uh, uh, different colors in this graph. 
representing uh, one color per uh, uh, kind of cancer. And uh, uh, there is a very broad variety. And as a matter of fact, most of the tissues or of the cells in your body have the, the possibility of becoming cancer cells uh, given the right uh, uh, insult is, uh, is, uh, is provided to them. This makes, of course, very tricky to come up with a uh, universal treatment for cancer because every cancer is going to be different from, uh, uh, and, and, uh, from, from each other. Every, for example, the prostate cancer is very, very different from stomach cancer. And even within the same cancer type, uh, there are many different uh, subtypes. So this is true, for example, for uh, breast cancer. So we really need to come up with more of a uh, therapeutic approach which is individualized, and that's what immunotherapy could uh, uh, provide an answer to, as I will explain later. Uh, there are different things that characterize uh, cancer cells, and in these uh, uh, scientific articles, two uh, major researchers in the field have uh, uh, identified some common features uh, that make cancer cell uh, uh, being so. Uh, these are all features that more or less are uh, what we would call cell intrinsic, uh, meaning that they are features that uh, affect the behavior of the uh, cancer cell. For example, cancer cells are able to uh, evade the mechanisms that suppress the growth uh, that normal cells have. Uh, as you can see in this slide, uh, which was published uh, in uh, a paper in the uh, early 2000s, uh, there is no immunology and there is no mention to the immune system in this slide. Then 10 years went uh, uh, by, and in 2011, uh, the same scientific publication was uh, revised uh, and in this new uh, publication, uh, the two authors uh, in the, uh, uh, identified uh, different uh, uh, features that are shared among all cancer cells that we call all marks of cancer. And as you can see from this slide, uh, one common feature that was identified in the 10 years of research that was made from 2000 and 2011 is the ability of avoiding uh, the immune destruction. And this is a key feature of cancer that now we know to be true, that it's important for cancer to be able to escape uh, the uh, immune recognition and the immune destruction in order to uh, develop. So the other question that I have to ask is, uh, uh, what is the immune system? And this is something that I'm very passionate about, being uh, uh, myself uh, uh, an immunologist in the first place. So the immune system is uh, the ultimate line of defense of your body against uh, uh, everything that is dangerous uh, for the homeostasis of the body. And it is true for microbes, uh, but it is also true for uh, cancer. It's a very complex uh, uh, system, and these are highlighted uh, in this slide uh, just few of the uh, components, uh, cellular components of the, of the immune system. For example, there are these cells called phagocytes, which eat uh, dangerous cells. There are cells like natural killer cells or T cells, which most often uh, kill uh, dangerous cells. And there are B cells, which are basically cells that produce uh, antibodies, uh, which are molecules that have a neutralizing effect uh, against uh, uh, pathogens. It is a bit more complicated than that. This is just a slide from a textbook uh, showing uh, uh, a, a variety of immune cells. Uh, to be entirely honest with you, these are not even all the different immune cells that uh, we can find in our body, but to try to simplify, simplify this, uh, this concept, what the immune system does is when there is an insult in the body, the immune system is able to sense that the insult has been, uh, 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 is there. And after that, there is a phase of communication in which the cells that sense the insult communicate with other immune cells, and not only other immune cells, but other cells in the body, which at that point recruit uh, different kind of immune cells which are uh, involved into the response to the insult. So the basic idea uh, is that if something is wrong in your body, the immune system is able to uh, detect it and potentially fight it. And this is true also for, uh, uh, for cancer. One particular kind of cell, uh, cell immune cells that I would like to, uh, to point your attention towards are cells that belong to the cytotoxic branch of the immune response. These are called T and uh, natural killer cells, which have in common the uh, uh, ability of recognizing uh, cells that are dangerous for the body, even if we, they use different mechanisms to do so. And uh, they're also able to kill 
the cells that are dangerous for uh, uh, your own body. This is well depicted, uh, I hope, in this uh, uh, cartoon. So normally, T and natural killer cells would patrol the body and would encounter a healthy cell. The interaction with the healthy cells usually suppress the cytotoxic cell, resulting in tolerance against the healthy cell, which is then spared by killing from the T and the natural killer cell. So nothing is wrong with these cells, which is safe. But the immune system is also able to discriminate between an healthy cell, right here, and a tumor cell, right here. In this case, the T and the natural killer cell will be able to recognize the tumor cells over the healthy cell, be activated by this recognition, and end up killing, eliminating the tumor cells. This creates a uh, first barrier, and even a second and third barrier, uh, uh, against uh, uh, the uh, challenge that tumors uh, uh, provide to the, to the body. Uh, but very often, uh, not only T cells and natural killer cells, but also a plethora of other immune cells are present in uh, both human and uh, uh, mouse tumors. We often refer to uh, mouse models to uh, study the uh, immune response against tumors, and it's a very useful model. So this leads to the question of why uh, these cells, which I've showed you before, being able to eliminate tumor cells, don't effectively kill uh, the tumor cells that they are found uh, uh, within. And, uh, Research over the years have found many, many mechanisms uh, that are common uh, between different kinds of tumors, uh, which are uh, involved into suppressing the ability of the immune system to recognize or uh, eliminate uh, the cancer cell. This is a very active area of research, even in my lab, and there are, uh, I'm sure, many more mechanisms that have to be discovered uh, that uh, uh, regulate the immune response uh, against uh, cancer. I do not want to go into great details into this because uh, it becomes uh, too uh, complicated. But uh, the bottom line here, the take-home message is that there are many mechanisms in place that will suppress the immune response in the tumors. With this in mind, uh, I would like to start talking about uh, uh, the immunotherapy evolution. Because if we know that the uh, immune system is capable of fighting cancer, but that cancer has mechanisms uh, to suppress the activation of the immune cells and their ability of killing the tumor cells, then there is a rationale that we can uh, uh, embrace that we can uh, uh, try to potentiate this immune response to provide therapeutic benefits. Immunotherapy, and, and this is the and this is the idea is uh, uh, behind this uh, is uh, can we use our own immune system to uh, fight uh, uh, cancer? The challenge with this, uh, the challenge of immunotherapy, as I mentioned before, is that cancer is not one disease, but it's a collection of diseases. Therefore, it's going to be very hard to find a one fits for all uh, solution. But since the immune system is a very uh, complicated and uh, uh, complicated system in which many cells are in, uh, uh, involved into the recognition of the challenge, uh, including tumor cells, and in the elimination of the challenge, including the tumor cells, then there is, a, there is a real opportunity of making immunotherapy the ultimate personalized therapy by which we can harness uh, the patient's own immune system against the uh, cancer. This is not a, a new idea, and as a matter of fact, uh, this idea was initially fought in the uh, late uh, 19th century uh, by Coley, who developed the first, uh, can, can, first cancer vaccine. Uh, and uh, uh, there was a first enthusiasm phase in the late 70s, early 80s about cancer immunotherapy, which many studies were, uh, uh, which many studies were generated showing how the immune system can uh, fight cancer, but then in the uh, up to the uh, late 90s, uh, the failure of some clinical trials uh, employing uh, immunotherapeutic agents uh, led to what we call the skepticism phase, in which the idea of uh, using the, the immune system to uh, fight cancer was a little bit wearing off. But then in the 90s, the discovery of uh, uh, this molecule, which I'm going to spend a little bit of time describing, called checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, led to what we now are living, a renaissance phase, 
in which uh, many uh, cancer immunotherapies have been developed and have also uh, successfully entered the clinic, uh, becoming also frontline for some uh, for some uh, disease. And this also led to the uh, uh, Nobel Prize uh, awarded uh, to uh, Jim Ellison and uh, Tasuko Andro for their uh, key discoveries on uh, how the immune system is uh, uh, suppressed uh, by uh, tumor cells. Uh, one thing that is uh, uh, interesting to notice, however, is that uh, even traditional kind of cancer uh, treatments, including chemo and radiotherapy, uh, actually ultimately also lead to the activation of the immune system and can therefore be considered a sort of a immunotherapy. What is happening here in this cartoon is that you have a tumor right here, and there are some uh, uh, T cells uh, in the tumor microenvironment, which, however, for whatever reason, are not able to eliminate the cancer cells. There are some mechanisms in place right here, which led to the suppression of the uh, immune response. There are also these cells right here on the left, which I would like to point your attention toward, which are called dendritic cells. And these cells are uh, uh, basically uh, an immune booster. So they would uh, be able to communicate with the T cells and let them aware that the cancer is, uh, is, uh, is in place and that the, 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 the T cells have to eliminate the uh, cancer cells. They're involved into activating uh, the, T cell, uh, the T cells against the tumors. What would happen with uh, uh, radio and chemotherapy is that the cancer cells are eliminated. But it's not often uncommon, it's not uncommon that some cancer cells uh, develop resistance to radiotherapy and chemotherapy. Uh, and that's the reason why there is some failure of this uh, treatment. However, the cells that do die leave some debris, some cellular debris, and these debris are able to activate these uh, uh, dendritic cells that at that point are able to communicate with the uh, uh, T cells and the T cells are now capable of uh, uh, recognizing the cancer cells and uh, eliminate the uh, cancer cells. So even conventional treatments that we have uh, uh, been given for decades now to uh, cancer patients rely strongly on, a, on the immune system uh, for their therapeutic uh, uh, efficacy. There are different points in which the uh, uh, immune system can fail in uh, eliminating the cancer cells. Uh, for example, one is exclusion. The immune system might not be able to properly reach the tumors. Uh, another one is lack of recognition, in which the tumor is able to hide from the immune system that at that point uh, is not aware the tumor is there. And another one is suppression, which is basically the phenomenon by which the immune system is able to recognize the tumors it infiltrates the tumor, so you can find immune cells within the tumors, but these immune cells are not active. They're in a suppressed uh, state, so they cannot effectively kill the tumor. And what immunotherapy does is basically to be able to tackle everyone and each of these uh, different mechanisms that regulate the uh, response uh, to uh, the immune response to cancer. Immunotherapy is not one kind of therapy, as there is not one kind of cancer, we need multiple therapies, and it's more like an umbrella of therapies which uh, uh, have in common the idea that by activating uh, the immune system, we can at that point uh, uh, fight, uh, better fight cancer. These are just four kinds of immunotherapies that I want to briefly discuss with you today, vaccination, adoptive cell transfer, oncolytic viruses, and the use of uh, therapeutic antibodies. All these therapies have, uh, uh, behind the, their development, years and years of research in basic science and then in translational science, and knowing the basic mechanisms that regulated the immune system was key to uh, develop uh, ways of uh, modifying those mechanisms and leading to the development of these uh, uh, therapies. So let me start with vaccination. Uh, the reason why I want to start with vaccination is because as an immunologist, uh, uh, vaccines uh, really are the uh, go-to strategy. We really like to vaccinate people because by vaccination, you are able to elicit a very strong immune response against uh, a challenge. And in most cases, uh, this is very effective if you think, for example, about uh, uh, a different kind of microbes. In this case, we talk about prophylactic vaccination. 
basically we provide you with uh, a vaccine before you are exposed uh, to uh, the virus, for example. And therefore, when you are actually exposed to the virus, uh, you are protected against that, uh, that challenge, the viral challenge. Uh, we talk about therapeutic vaccines uh, when instead uh, there is uh, a, a challenge already uh, already there for example a tumor and we need uh, and we provide a booster of the immune response uh, a, uh, try to potentiate the immune response when the tumor is already there of course this is a problem and prophylactic vaccine work uh, uh, generally better than therapeutic vaccines uh, and this is well explained uh, uh, by the success of vaccines against the uh, uh, viruses, for example, and the other pathogens. But even in cancer, prophylactic vaccination had uh, a major success, which is the uh, 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 campaign that was recently launched against uh, to vaccinate uh, uh, children for uh, uh, HPV, uh, for the uh, human papilloma virus. This is the major cause of uh, uh, cervical cancer. Uh, but also for uh, uh, anal and uh, uh, and the neck cancer as a big involvement in uh, males, uh, and uh, uh, actually it, there are some uh, excellent studies showing that uh, HPV vaccination has managed to decrease by more than 90 percent the incidence of uh, uh, the cervical cancer uh, development because by generating an immune response against this virus this virus is no longer able to infect the uh, patient cells and therefore is no longer able to uh, cause uh, uh, cancer. Therapeutic vaccines, as I was mentioning before, are uh, way harder to uh, develop and they have not been as successful as uh, the prophylactic vaccine. And this is because when tumors are already there, it's harder to treat them. However, there are still some efforts that have been made, and uh, this is the idea behind the, the dritic cell vaccine. These dritic cells are cells uh, that uh, have, uh, we have encountered in uh, a couple of slides ago. These are the cells that are able to uh, tell to the cytotoxic cells of the uh, immune system, to your T cells and to your natural killer cells, that something is wrong uh, with the body, and that they have to activate a cytotoxic response, a response that will eliminate the tumors. So what is being done now is basically to isolate uh, the dendritic cells or precursors of the dendritic cells, then grow from the patient, uh, from the cancer, patient with the cancer, then grow these cells to a very large number, and then in vitro, so this is, uh, we do this in the lab, and then we uh, maturate these cells uh, uh, and we make them equipped to communicate uh, with the uh, uh, T cells uh, uh, in your body, and then we re-inject these cells uh, uh, in patients, uh, hoping that they will provide a, a, a higher level of activation to the cytotoxic cells, and that those cytotoxic cells will then be able to uh, fight and kill the, uh, uh, the cancer cells. I don't want to spend too much time on this uh, right now, and I would like to move uh, to adoptive cell transfer, which has recently been on the uh, news, actually. So the idea of adoptive cell therapy is that your T cells are actually able to fight the tumor, but they need a little bit of an help. And not always it's, a, it's a convenient or easy for us uh, to be able to provide that help uh, with the T cells that are already in the body of the patient. So we sometimes need to manipulate the T cells in the lab and then reinfuse them into the patient. This is the bit that did uh, uh, in this cartoon where you have these T cells which have different specificity. You have to know that the T cells in the body, they are not, not all your T cells are going to be able to recognize and kill the tumor cells. Only few of them will have this capacity. For example, in this cartoon, this blue cell is able to recognize this tumor, but is suppressed by this cell, by, by, by this tumor. Whereas this yellow, purple, and green uh, cells are not able to uh, effectively recognize the, uh, the tumor. So what we do here, is basically to isolate those T cells uh, from the patient. And then uh, in the lab, we uh, provide some uh, uh, growth factor to these uh, cells, and we are able to selectively expand only the T cells that are able to recognize effectively the tumor. At this point, if before you have only one T cell out of four that were able to recognize and effectively kill the tumor cells, 
Now, by using this experimental trick, we have amplified the repertoire of T cells, the number of T cells that is able to effectively uh, uh, challenge the, uh, the tumors. We can, of course, at that point, reinfuse the tumor specific T cells into the patient and hope that those T cells will have a therapeutic effect. This works very well. And a recent paper published, a uh, scientific paper published in uh, uh, this uh, journal Nature Medicine in 2018, has adopted this very therapy, that, this very uh, therapeutic approach that I described. What you can see here is uh, uh, breast cancer uh, uh, shown uh, uh, before the therapy. The yellow arrow will show the tumors, where the tumors are. So you have one year, one right here, one right here. And 22 months after therapies, you can see that there are scars where the tumor used to be, but the tumors are completely gone. So this is a very effective therapy uh, when it works, uh, with the problem, however, that it's uh, uh, very cumbersome to uh, undergo the uh, experimental process of isolating those cells, generating a large number of the cells, and then refuse them into patients. But it's a very effective therapy, and there is a very high hope that this could uh, uh, be uh, transformative for the uh, treatment of some kind of cancer. However, there is also a different idea uh, in the field of adoptive cell therapy, uh, which is uh, what if uh, there is a chance uh, to effectively make all these T cells uh, specific against the tumor. So what happens here is that we would isolate all the T cells that are present in the body of a patient, or the majority of them, and at that point, uh, try to make them all specific against cancer. There are technologies in place that would allow us to do that, uh, I don't have to enter into the details of this. This is uh, uh, quite complicated uh, uh, biotechnology. But what you have to know is that there is a way in the lab in which your T cell, which previously was not able to recognize the tumor, by genetic manipulation is now able to bind uh, uh, and effectively kill the tumor. Uh, these are called uh, uh, CAR T cells. CAR stands for chimeric antigen receptors, and they have been recently in the news because they have been approved by the uh, Food and Drug Administration in uh, uh, the United States for the treatment of uh, uh, a number of uh, hematopoietic, hematopo hematological diseases. And in Canada, there is an active effort, uh, even in my research center, uh, for trying to implement this uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the country. So the idea here is that at this point, once we have genetically edited the, these uh, uh, T cells in the lab, they will all be able to recognize their tumor cells, and these super CAR T cells will be able to uh, get into the uh, into the tumor and uh, uh, and kill the tumor. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, was recently approved by uh, the uh, FDA uh, for two different kind of uh, uh, indications. And uh, most notably, as some uh, uh, striking therapeutic results, this is the first children who was treated, uh, a child who was treated uh, uh, with uh, uh, CAR T cells, Emily, and she uh, is now uh, six years uh, uh, cancer free, and she's foster child for uh, 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 cancer for CAR uh, T cell therapy. So let me now move to uh, antibodies, which are very effective ways uh, uh, by which, uh, uh, in the field, we have uh, considered uh, 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 treating cancer. And there are different ways we can do that, uh, but uh, today I'm just going to discuss uh, uh, one of those with you. So first of all, you probably have heard of antibodies, but uh, just to be on the same page, antibodies are white-shaped molecules. Uh, looks like this, more or less, uh, which are produced by these uh, cells in the body that are called uh, B cells. What you need to know about these cells is that they uh, have a very high ability of binding uh, other molecules in the body uh, that are called antigens. So let me give you a, a better example of this. For example, if you have a virus that is infecting a, a patient, uh, the virus is able to infect uh, healthy cells, replicate within the healthy cells, and eventually is going to kill the healthy cells and spread to the next cell. Even in the next cells, the uh, virus is going to duplicate and uh, will eventually try to spread the, to a third cell. At that point, though, the immune system is elected, and these B cells are able to be called in uh, uh, to fight the infection. Uh, they do so by producing these molecules called antibodies. And what the antibodies do is basically to bind to the virus 
and prevent the virus from entering the other uh, healthy cells, effectively eliminating uh, the virus infection. This is also what we try to do with vaccination. We try to generate a very strong uh, B cell response that will generate antibodies that will protect you for a very long term, very long time against the uh, agents that you have been vaccinated uh, with. The good thing about antibodies is that they're fairly easy to make in the lab, doesn't cost much money, and uh, uh, we have been able to uh, uh, engineer and employ antibodies uh, to, uh, uh, for therapeutic purposes, and particularly to take off uh, the breaks from the uh, immune response. So let me just give you an example of how we use these antibodies. Uh, what I've told you so far is that your T cells, so your cytotoxic uh, 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 cells uh, of the immune system, are able to kill the tumor cells. What I also told you is that the T cells most of the time are not effective uh, because they're mechanisms that suppress uh, this uh, activity. But what I have not told you is that most of these uh, uh, mechanisms rely on the engagement of proteins that are present on the surface of the T cells. These proteins are called uh, uh, checkpoint receptors, and basically they are inhibitory receptors that when they bind to their ligand, which is often present in the tumor cells, convey an inhibitory signal to the T cells, which suppress their activation. So you can think about this as uh, an immunological break. The T cells that have these molecules are no longer able to fight the tumors because uh, there is a break that is pushing against their uh, activation. Put in more simpler terms, the T cells and the natural killer cells uh, try to infiltrate the tumor and they effectively manage to eliminate uh, some of these uh, uh, tumor cells. Eventually, though, uh, these immunological mechanisms uh, uh, kick in and the T cells and the natural killer cells are no longer able to kill the tumor because they start producing these uh, checkpoint receptors and they're inhibited. At this point, the tumor is able to spread. The therapeutic idea here is that if we now produce some antibodies that are specific and then selectively bind and block the activity of these uh, receptors, we can now reinforce uh, the immune response against the tumor because the T cells and the natural killer cells are going to be reactivated and they will be able to effectively eliminate uh, the uh, cancer cells. This worked beautifully in the clinic and tumors that were previously thought to be not curable uh, are now more manageable thanks to this uh, immunotherapy. You can see here uh, a, a landmark uh, study uh, by Odi and colleagues uh, published in the New England in uh, 2010 about this uh, drug called ipilinumab, which is nothing but an antibody against uh, one of these um, immunological breaks. And uh, uh, this is the uh, uh, spectacular results that have been obtained by another one of these drugs called nivolumab, in which you have these uh, uh, tumors in the lung of these patients that four months after treatment have completely uh, uh, disappeared. There are many of these molecules in the, uh, in the body that uh, suppress the activation of the cytotoxic cells, including T cells and natural killer cells. And there are therefore endless combinations that can be thought of uh, in which we can try to manipulate the signals that the T cells receive in such a way that we can make the T cells and the natural killer cells in the body more effective against uh, uh, the tumor. Let me conclude the, the immunotherapy part of this presentation uh, by talking about oncolytic viruses. And this is, of course, something that is very close to my heart because it's a story that has been uh, uh, pioneered by a colleague of mine uh, at the OHRI, Dr. John Bell, who is also an amazing mentor uh, uh, for, uh, for me right now. And uh, uh, the idea behind oncolytic viruses is that we want to give cancer a cold. Oncolytic viruses are viruses that have a specific uh, ability of uh, uh, infecting uh, cancer cells and eliminating cancer cells. And by doing so, they are able to boost the immune response, as I will show you uh, in a bit. What you need to know, however, is that uh, it's very tricky for viruses to infect and uh, effectively replicate into healthy cells, because healthy cells have something called uh, an 
intrinsic antiviral response that is common in uh, uh, most uh, healthy cells, which basically acts against the virus and prevents its replication. And viruses have to somehow hide from these antiviral responses, but in most of, but in most of the cases, you could be, uh, the healthy cells are able to be protected by viral infections. However, as I mentioned before, during cellular transformations, there are a number of mutations that accumulate into cancer cells, and these mutations very often target cellular components, molecular components of the antiviral response. And this makes these components not effective and makes the cancer cells more susceptible to viral infection. This is well depicted in this cartoon right here, in which healthy cells can be maybe infected by the virus, but then the antiviral response kicks in and the virus is eliminated before, the, uh, before it can spread uh, on the next cell. However, in cancer cells, this antiviral response is not uh, very effective. The virus can replicate and can uh, eventually eliminate uh, the uh, cancer cells and spread to the next cancer cell. In doing so, however, the virus, uh, in addition to killing the cancer cells, is also able to effectively activate the immune system and now the cytotoxic cells, both the T cells and the natural killer cells, are able to recognize the virus with higher, sorry, the cancer with higher affinity, with higher uh, efficacy, and uh, uh, will therefore have a more effective response uh, against uh, uh, the cancer. This is something that works uh, uh, very well in the clinic. Uh, this is not the oncolytic virus uh, we are currently working on in Ottawa, but it's uh, uh, something uh, different published in uh, 2008 uh, by uh, Parker and colleagues in Lancet Oncology. This is again another seminal study, in which this large mass that is uh, depicted right here was eliminated by injection of uh, these uh, oncolytic viruses uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, within the tumor. So let me give some uh, uh, thoughts of uh, uh, to conclude this uh, uh, presenta presentation about uh, uh, where we are and uh, uh, where uh, are we going. So in conclusion, what I think I showed you today, I hope I convinced you today, is that immunotherapy really revolutionized, revolutionized the uh, clinic approach to cancer and cancer that previously were thought not to be curable uh, now have a chance of being treated. And uh, this provided, of course, hopes, uh, uh, a new hope to, uh, to many cancer patients. However, uh, there is still a lot of work that has to be done. Uh, there are many, many open questions in cancer immunology and cancer immunotherapy. For example, one big question that we have is that we know that cancer therapy works for some patients, but it does not work or does not, does not last long for many patients. And one key question that we are trying to answer in my lab and uh, many other labs around the world is what can we do to improve the response of the immune system against cancer and of the existing drug uh, 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 to make them more effective. Uh, there are also uh, many immunotherapies that are available. I just described four to you, but even without this, there are many some kind of uh, uh, cancer immunotherapies. And one major challenge is trying to understand how do we choose the most effective therapy that is going to work uh, for uh, uh, every uh, individual patient. Uh, in, in finally, uh, safety is still a major issue for some of these uh, uh, immunotherapies. The side effects can be uh, quite harsh. Uh, and one major fear of, this, of research right now is uh, how do we reduce the toxicity without compromising the efficacy of this uh, therapeutic approach. And of course, my thoughts on this is that research is going to be the answer to this uh, question. And when I say research, I don't necessarily mean research on cancer immunology, cancer immunotherapy, but also very basic research. It's in fact key for us in the translational field to be able to rely on the work of basic scientists that are involved into discovering the mechanisms that regulate the immune response. And uh, uh, by knowing more about the immune response, by knowing more about the interactions between the immune system and the tumors, we will be able to answer to all these questions in uh, a few years, uh, uh, something that I'm very optimistic uh, about. So let me conclude this uh, uh, presentation uh, thanking uh, all uh, uh, people in my lab, which uh, 
we, we do some of the work that I presented to you, uh, even I not gave any specific. Uh, I have a very uh, young and uh, yet very talented uh, research group. Uh, these are very motivated students who uh, really work very hard uh, to try to understand better how the immune system works and provide more uh, therapies for uh, cancer patients. Listed here a number of uh, agencies that have provided uh, uh, funds for my uh, lab to uh, operate. Uh, particularly the Cancer Research uh, uh, Society, uh, the Canadian uh, Institute of Health Research, and the uh, uh, Right for That, which is a terrific uh, um, um, non-profit organization uh, uh, raise money for uh, 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 prostate cancer. And finally, let me uh, uh, acknowledge the cancer, uh, Canadian Cancer Survival Network, who gave me this opportunity to uh, give this uh, webinar. Uh, and hopefully this uh, is something that uh, uh, is going to be helpful for uh, uh, in, in your cancer journey. And uh, uh, finally, thanks to all of you for uh, uh, your attention, and I will be very glad to take any questions that we uh, add in the time that I have left. Thanks, Michelle. We have some questions. So um, I, one of the questions is that they've noticed that there was a general upwards trend with respect to all cancer types. Is there an explanation for this upward trend, such as better cancer detection? Um, so the slide that I have shown uh, doesn't... Uh, um, so cancer is a, is a disease on the rise. Uh, so there are more uh, uh, cancer right now that are uh, being diagnosed with respect to, uh, for example, the 60s or the 70s, which are, is what I think was on the slide. Part of this is for sure improvement in uh, uh, technology, detection of technology. Uh, part of it is also the fact that people live longer now. Uh, and part of it is because we are now more effective in treating other things that previously were fatal to people. And so we are just giving cancer a better chance to, to develop, basically. Okay. And then is there a virus involved with prostate cancer? So this is something that my lab is actually actively uh, working on, and there are some research done at the uh, Ottawa Research Hospital, uh, and this is actually work that uh, I collaborate with uh, Dr. Bell and uh, Dr. Diallo, who are uh, leading this effort as well, in which we are trying to develop uh, new strategies uh, relying on oncolytic viruses to specifically target uh, uh, prostate cancer. Uh, prostate cancer is a challenge, a challenging cancer to treat with immunotherapy because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a cancer type that uh, it's not very well recognized by the immune system. And that's the reason why we decided to use oncolytic viruses uh, because oncolytic viruses really make the immune system uh, uh, recognizing the cancer better. What they do basically is to generate a sustained inflammation at the site where the tumor is in, and immune cells really like. Uh, sites where there is a strong inflammation. So we have hopes that we will be able to develop uh, uh, viruses that will be uh, useful for the uh, cure of prostatic cancer. And there are both clinical and preclinical efforts on, uh, on this side. Perfect. And then are there any side effects of vaccinating against cancer? So if you talk about the uh, prophylactic vaccination, uh, there is virtually no side effects. Uh, I know there is a lot of concerns nowadays, unfortunately, on vaccination, but vaccination really is one of the biggest achievements uh, that humanity made. If you think about it, we have uh, effectively eradicated diseases, uh, which means that we have uh, uh, fought and won against a microorganism. Uh, the side effect of vaccination is, uh, is negligible towards the uh, uh, positive effects of the, of the, of the vaccination, and uh, uh, they would just be uh, rash or uh, fever or uh, uh, all very manageable disorders, and nothing is real about correlations between vaccines as, and autism, for example, which I know is a concern sometimes for the uneducated public, but those are not real correlations and uh, there is no study showing that that's actually true. So the HPV vaccination is 
really something that uh, me as a scientist uh, would strongly advise, and I think the scientific community has reached a strong consensus on the fact that it's a very effective way of protecting your children against uh, uh, a quite hard disease to treat. Cervical cancer is, is not an easy disease to treat. It's often fatal. And to go on with that, is there a certain age that people should get vaccinated or who would you encourage to va get vaccinated? There are guidelines uh, uh, which are specific from country to country and I am uh, not a clinician myself. Uh, so I, I believe that in uh, uh, I believe in, in, in the United States where I, where I trained and when this was firstly available, I believe it was before 23 year old, but I don't want to, I don't want to give false uh, information. So I'm sure this is a very widely available uh, information. And if you talk to your uh, uh, general practitioner, uh, it's very easy to, to get. Okay, and then what are some other ways to boost immune system while under immu immunotherapy? I'm sorry, I didn't get the question. There was a problem with the line. Sorry. It's um, what are some other ways to boost immune immune system while under immunotherapy? So, uh, you know, those are the four ones that I discussed are the uh, main ones that are currently in use. Uh, but there is a nuance of flavors uh, of these different therapies. For example, I have discussed uh, antibodies. And what I have uh, uh, very briefly uh, described is one way by which antibodies are uh, used to block the breaks that are in place for the immune system. The immune system. Uh, there are different ways we can use antibodies. For example, people have fought and effectively uh, uh, have used antibodies that would bind specifically to the tumor cells and will make other immune cells uh, be recognizing the tumor cells uh, uh, better. Uh, some other antibodies can be conjugated with, for example, with toxins. And if you address those antibodies against uh, uh, molecules that are specific of the tumor cells, they will cover up the uh, tumor cells and the toxins will be internalized exclusively by the tumor cells and that will kill the tumor cells. There are also different ways of engineering uh, uh, the dendritic cells, this is talking about the vaccination, uh, they become a little bit complicated, uh, but on the broad, uh, from the broad point of view, those are the four main ways that we are currently using for uh, treating cancer patients, sorry, for uh, uh, approaching uh, cancer immunotherapy. Okay, and then the next one is, do you anticipate that immunotherapy may replace traditional chemo or radiation treatments in the future? Uh, I'm sorry, you said I'm afraid, or do I think? Do you think? Oh, uh, so there is a there is a there is a value in uh, uh, chemo and uh, radiotherapy, and I don't think we are yet uh, at the place where chemo, sorry, where immunotherapy is going to be able to replace. Uh, uh, those more traditional, uh, those more traditional therapies in every cancer. For sure, there are some indications where uh, the use of uh, immunotherapy is advisable or uh, uh, preferable in uh, patients uh, uh, rather than chemo radiotherapy. Also, considering that chemo radiotherapy has uh, uh, quite strong side effects, uh, I have to disclose a conflict of interest that this is what my research program is based on. So I would like to think that, yes, we will eventually be able to find an immunological cure to, can to every kind of cancer, but I think we are uh, not there yet. Okay. And then it seems like the fight to control cancer has historically been challenged by cell adaptation to treatment. How much of a problem do you think this will be in using the immunology Immunology treatment. I'm sorry, I didn't get the first type, the first part of your question. The the, the line is is quite disturbed. Okay, it seems like the fight to control cancer has historically been challenged by cell adaptation to treatment. Yes, and, and how much? Of, yes, so it's a it, it's an excellent question actually, and uh, uh, this is something that we have uh, now start appreciating that tumor cells uh, are able to. 
uh, at the level of plasticity that is required to also be able to escape uh, the uh, immunotherapies that we provide. And in uh, uh, some circumstances that are, and this has been very well described for the CAR T-cell therapies as well as for the uh, uh, use of antibodies uh, to block these checkpoint molecules, which cancer find alternative ways uh, to escape the immune response, uh, even when the drugs are provided. Uh, so it, it is a concern that is a, a very active uh, uh, field of research, even in my lab. Uh, and there, I believe that the key at that point is going to be the combination of different immunotherapies, in which you basically tackle the tumors from two different angles, so that it's going to be very challenging for the tumor to find uh, uh, different uh, uh, ways of escaping uh, these, uh, these different uh, uh, therapies. All right, and the next question, can lung cancer and breast cancer, et cetera, use the same type of immunotherapy, one drug for every cancer? Uh, so that is unfortunately not the case. It would make uh, the life of my colleagues, uh, medical oncologist colleagues, uh, a bit easier. Uh, but those are very heterogeneous diseases. Uh, just think about breast cancer, there are different subtypes of cancers, uh, of breast cancers. and uh, every different type uh, as uh, a different way in which escape the immune response. And, and, and that's what I meant really when I talked about personalized therapy, is the fact that every patient is different, even with the very same cancer. So if, for example, if you have a triple negative breast cancer, uh, you probably, your cancer is probably different than the one of another patient. And uh, the reason why that is true is because not only your tumors is different, they are different, uh, but also your immune system uh, is somehow different. And uh, what I think is going to be a game changer in the field and what I am actively working on, and I, that would be one of my uh, uh, research dream, if you will, is that when a cancer patient shows up in the clinic, uh, we would do two main things. One, we would try to characterize the tumor, so we would have a look at how the tumors look like, and two, we will have a look at how the immune system look like, looks like. This will give us a more comprehensive idea of how the tumor is actively escaping uh, the immune response. For example, for one kind of uh, patient, one, one, one person, one, one, one uh, individual, there might be some molecules involved, and we could target those molecules. But those very same molecules might not be the ones that are involved in the same kind of cancer of another patient. And we would need different drugs to effectively elicit a strong immune response in the second patient. So that's what I meant when I said that this is a very personalized approach to, uh, to cancer therapy. Because knowing the immune system, knowing the cancer, will lead uh, to a very individualized uh, kind of therapy. Perfect. And then for the cellular therapy treatment, now that we would have a larger blue killer T cell population in the example shown, what yeah. side effects does this incur? I am concerned about the body's homostasis being imbalanced. This has been one of the major challenges of CAR T cells. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, uh, the toxicity of CAR T cells is still a problem and it's uh, uh, manageable in most cases, uh, but they still have a quite high toxicity because what you want to what you want to consider is that those scar T cells would be producing a very massive immune response. And as a matter of fact, the uh, child that I showed in the in the picture uh, developed a very severe uh, autoimmune response, basically, uh, in, uh, uh, after she got the first shot of the. Uh, uh, of CAR T cells. Fortunately, she was in an excellent uh, uh, cancer center, and uh, where both research clinicians, uh, sorry, both researchers and clinicians were were tightly together, and it was suggested that the side effect that she was developing was due to a particular molecule. So the clinicians were able to uh, block that one molecule, and now she's uh, she's fine. Uh, so she she was saved basically. Uh, but the, the side effects of these therapies, uh, uh, the CAR therapies in particular, are still a major concern, even if there is hope that we will be able to manage the toxicity. And there's some recent discoveries that have been made just probably a couple of weeks ago 
which lead to um, to much hope. Perfect. And then, why does immunotherapy have so many side effects? So it, it's a hard question to answer because uh, every immunotherapy is different and every immunotherapy will have a different side effect. But the broad, uh, the broad uh, uh, answer here would be the one that was provided by the question before, that by playing with the immune system to try to activate the immune system against cancer, you are effectively changing the homeostasis of the immune response. And there are mechanisms in place in the body that keep the immune system and the immune response very controlled to prevent autoimmunity. And uh, when we provide drugs that make the immune system fighting cancer, most of the time we break those mechanisms and that leads to autoimmune reactions. Uh, those autoimmune reactions for the most are manageable, again, uh, and the uh, and the uh, benefits to the patients are higher than the side effects, uh, but uh, these are not treatments that are necessarily harsher than uh, your chemo or radiotherapy, whose side effects are still very, very strong. Okay, and then we got two more questions. For sure. Um, so for chemo rate and radiation, is it possible to also give at the same time the immunotherapy? Yes, so this is a, again, very active field of research. There is, a, this has been very effectively uh, done in uh, preclinical studies, and uh, uh, it's uh, an avenue that uh, it's been uh, very strongly uh, considered because of the idea that by combining different therapies, uh, we would give less chance to the tumor to uh, adapt and uh, escape those therapies. Okay. And then how can you find the difference among patients' immune systems? Okay. This, is a, this is a very excellent question, actually, and uh, something that uh, we are working on, and we are not alone. Uh, there are many, many research groups who are uh, trying to find what's the best way. Uh, it's, uh, it's a challenging uh, uh, it's a challenging uh, point because most of the time, particularly for solid tumors, uh, they are within the body and it's not very easy for us to access uh, the immune cells that are present in the tumor and we have to rely on cells, the immune cells that are in the blood uh, to have an idea of how they look like. But there, is, there are very high-end technologies uh, now in place uh, uh, which uh, uh, allow us to uh, work with a very limited amount of samples and get very high level of information on uh, uh, on those uh, on those immune cells that we want to study. Uh, the technology is a bit complicated to explain, but it's uh, becoming more and more feasible. Okay, and then I lied. There's going to be two more. So, sure. what role does inflammation play in inhibiting or in stimulating the immune response? This is a uh, great question, uh, which would require many, many slides to be explained, but uh, broadly, inflammation is necessary for an immune response to uh, be productive. Uh, it's uh, one thing that the immune system really likes is to have inflammation that will lead to certain events, which brings the immune cells where they have to be, and made them work in the way they're supposed to be. Uh, so generally speaking, inflammation is something that it's good against cancer, at least a certain kind of inflammation, but there are some great studies uh, from actually, uh, some of them led by a fellow Italian scientist, uh, who have, which have shown that uh, inflammation in some tumors actually has the counterproductive effect to generate uh, an environment in which tumors uh, uh, are actually uh, benefiting uh, benefiting from the from the inflammation. So it really depends on the kind of cancer, uh, and it really depends on uh, the kind of inflammation that is uh, uh, that is in place. Thank you. And then last one: um, Do you think healthcare could possibly ever support personalized medicine, even with the level of success so far with HPV immunization? 
Um, I think that it should, uh, but I'm not a politician, so it's not something that I can uh, comment uh, considering budgets. Uh, but with time, uh, all the technology that now costs uh, uh, a lot of money is going to be uh, going to be cheaper. So ideally, we will also develop new technologies, and uh, that's the point of the uh, that's the point of funding uh, the basic research. Uh, is that by doing the basic research, we will need uh, we will always need less and less information. From the patient because we will know more specifically what to look at and uh, this is an effort that is always a self-refining effort so the more you the more we know the more we have to change what we look for uh, but generally speaking uh, uh, I am very optimistic about uh, the development of this okay thank you everyone for the question